Welcome back to the Byzantine Catholic Seminary's online course, The Plain Chant of the Byzantine Catholic Church. In this lecture, we will look at the history of Christian liturgical chant among the Slavic peoples of Russia and its immediate surroundings. By the way, you may be wondering why, in a course on prostopenia, why we are spending two weeks studying other kinds of chant. The reasons are fairly simple. Last week, you learned a good bit about the history of Christian chant in general, and about how Byzantine Greek chant evolved along with the Byzantine liturgical rite. This week we will look at the music that formed the most basic stratum of our own prostopinial singing tradition, and see how language, politics, and geography can affect church singing. The lands to the north of the Byzantine Empire were in the hands of barbarians, the Avars, Slavs, and Khazars. Sometime in the 19th century, According to the Russian Primary Chronicle, a community of Slavs undergoing civil war invited a group of Norsemen, that is, Vikings, to come and rule over them. These particular Norsemen were called the Rus, and under their leader Rurik they established cities in what is now northern Russia. Two of Rurik's princes on a trip to Constantinople conquered a city called Kiev that had previously been ruled by the Khazars, a Turkish people. Eventually, the Rus established a loose confederation of states with Norse rulers and a Slav population. Kiev became the capital, and this confederation is known today to historians as the land of the Kievan Rus. As you can see from the map, a number of major rivers crossed the lands of the Kievan Rus. The Norsemen maintained trade routes that ran from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea and Constantinople. The orange area on the map to the right shows the region of the Kievan Rus at the start of the reign of Grand Prince Sviatoslav, who ruled from 963 to 972. In the year 863, two brothers from Constantinople, Kirill, a professor of philosophy, and Methodius, the abbot of a Greek monastery, were sent to preach the gospel to the Slavs living along the Danube River. They translated the Gospel and the services of the Byzantine liturgy into the old Bulgarian language, which later evolved into Church Slavonic, and created a Slavic alphabet based on Greek letters. In its final form, this alphabet was known as Cyrillic. Cyril and Methodius did not directly evangelize the Kievan Rus. Their mission was to the peoples to the south and west of the Rus. But the language and alphabet they used to spread the teachings of Christ became part of the common inheritance of the Slav peoples. In the year 988, Grand Prince Vladimir of Kiev was baptized by representatives of the Church of Constantinople and married Anna, the sister of the Byzantine Emperor Basil II. Prince Vladimir later called for all his people to accept baptism, first in Kiev and then in the other cities of the Kievan Rus. In 1037, the records of the, of the Kievan Rus state indicate that a Greek metropolitan was appointed for Kiev by the Patriarch of Constantinople. As the early bishops of Kiev, as well as the wife of the Grand Prince, were Greeks, it is quite likely that the Greek language and Byzantine chant were used in their presence, while Slavonic was used for liturgies in other places. In 1053, according to an early Russian chronicle, quote, three Greek singers, inspired by God, came with their families. It is from them that angel-like singing, wonderful singing in the eight tones, as well as three-part sweet singing, and the most beautiful Demist Veni singing to the praise and glory of God originated in the Russian lands. In 1056 or 1057, we have a gospel book written at that time called the Ostromirov Gospel, a Slavonic gospel book containing ekphonetic signs. And it's excerpts from this is shown to the right. Take a look at the fairly simple marks that divide up the phrasing in this excerpt. Adopting Byzantine Christianity had a number of advantages for the Kievan Rus. The Greek liturgical services had already been translated into a Slavic language, namely Old Bulgarian, which evolved into Church Slavonic. Also, travel between the lands of Rus and the Byzantine Empire was fairly straightforward. 
But it remains to be asked, when did the Rus begin to sing and chant liturgical services in Slavonic, and from whom did they learn? After the death of St. Methodius in 885, one of his assistants, named Clement, went to Bulgaria, and was consecrated the first bishop of the city of Okrid. There he established a school which taught, among other things, liturgical singing. This school was in existence for at least a century, until after the baptism of the Rus. The Greek writer Theophylact compared the singers of the school favorably to those in Constantinople, but we do not know in which language they sang, whether it was Greek or a Slavic language. Later in the year 990, Okrid became the capital of a large Bulgarian empire. It engaged in warfare against the Byzantine Empire, and in the year 1014 this Bulgarian Empire was destroyed by the Byzantine Emperor Basil II. So it's entirely possible that Slavic liturgical singing began in Bulgaria and was transmitted to the people of the neighboring regions, including the Kievan Rus. This is particularly likely, given that some histories recount that the first bishops in the lands of the Rus were actually came from Bulgaria rather than from Greece or from Constantinople. This makes more sense when we realize that Bulgaria had an existing Christian kingdom with its own hierarchy, who were using the Slavic language, and had already translated the liturgical books into that language. Why do I mention this? Because even in our own time, the old Russian chronicles have been cited to prove that our church singing was taken directly from Greece, and I want you to realize that life is often more complicated than it seems. After 988, Kiev became the ecclesiastical center of the Rus. It was not only the residence of the great prince, it was also the cathedral seat of the metropolitan or chief bishop of the land, as well as a center of secular and sacred culture. Kievan church culture was directly modeled on that of Constantinople. In fact, the cathedral church was named Holy Wisdom, just like Hagia Sophia. In the year 1051, a Slavic monk from Mount Athos named Anthony came to Kiev and established the Monastery of the Caves. This monastery became the fountainhead of monasticism among the Kievan Rus, as well as its liturgical singing, and many diocesan bishops were chosen from this monastery, which further spread the chant used there. In 1237, disaster struck when the lands of the Kievan Rus were invaded by an Asiatic people called the Mongols, or Tatars. The city of Kiev was destroyed and disappeared from the historical scene for about two centuries. Mongol presence in the lands of the Rus also limited communication with Constantinople, and many churches and records were destroyed. A city to the north of Russia, Novgorod, was the residence of the son of the great prince of the Rus, although ruled in part by a people's assembly. It was a major trade center, and all its bishops, except perhaps the first, were Slavs rather than Greeks. After, de after the destruction of Kiev, Novgorod assumed greater importance. We have early musical manuscripts from the city of Novgorod that contain both Greek and Slavonic texts side by side, written in the Cyrillic alphabet. After, after the destruction of Kiev by the Mongols, the Greek metropolitan Maximus moved his seat to the city of Vladimir on the Klyazma, and his successor moved it again to a city called Moscow, which was previously of very little significance. From this point on, the metropolitan of Kiev resided in the city of Moscow. Over time, Moscow assumed greater importance as the princes of that city threw off the Mongol yoke and it became a leader in the resistance to the Mongol horde. Eventually, the residence of the Grand Prince was firmly established in Moscow around 13, 1330. In 1448, the new bishop, newly elected Bishop Jonah, was not named Metropolitan of Kiev as had been tradition, but Metropolitan of Moscow since that was the city in which he was living, and Kiev had long since passed from view. From this time on, the metropolitans of Moscow 
were the leaders of the church among the Kievan Rus. A century later, in 1547, the Grand Prince Ivan IV of Moscow, also known as Ivan the Terrible, assumed the title of Tsar, or Emperor of all Russia. Note that this was sometime after the fall of Constantinople, and the Tsar saw himself as the protector of the church throughout Orthodoxy. Some decades later, in 1589, the Metropolitan Job of Moscow was named a Patriarch, thus making him equal with the other leaders of the Orthodox Church. In the year 1100, we see the first Slavonic musical manuscripts which have survived to the present day. These indicated the singing to be done, the presence of a head singer who was in charge of the solo melodies, a choir of singers led by a domestique, you might remember that among the Greeks this was called the domestikos, and also some singing which was to be done by the people. From this time the word kleros appears in manuscripts with two different meanings. One was that of a group of clergy associated with a church or a cathedral. It also came to mean the place in the church from which these clergy sang. Choirs of singers had places to the left and the right of the royal doors in the church, while soloists continued to sing from the ambo in the middle of the church as they had done in the Byzantine Empire. At this time some hymns and refrains were specifically to be sung by the people, usually short refrains to psalms and antiphons. The leaders of singing used chironomy, or hand gestures, to direct the singing. It is entirely possible that some of these gestures later came to influence the shape of the neumes or marks in liturgical manuscripts used to record the chant. In this era, cathedral and parish churches followed the sung office of Constantinople, or the asthmatic office, which we discussed last week. This sung office emphasized the kontakian rather than the canon, and make great use of sung responses by the people. Monasteries, on the other hand, followed the monastic typicon of Constantinople. A common type of chant sung in Slavonic and based on Byzantine models was sung throughout the lands of the Kievan Rus. It was called znamene chant, after the Slavic word znamya, meaning a sign or a mark. In other words, znamene chant could also be translated as chant written down in musical notation, as opposed to chant which was sung from memory. This form of chant was also called kruki, meaning hooks, and stolp notation, since it was used to record the hymns in the stolp or pillar of eight tones. Stolp notation is probably the best term for the kind of writing used for znamene chant, but we will continue to use the phrase znamene notation. An example of this notation is shown to the right. It is in the form of old or Paleo-Byzantine notation as adapted by the Slavs. This particular example, which begins Christos Rajdaetia Slavite, is the first Irmos of the ninth ode of the canon for the Nativity or the Feast of Christmas. The Znamini signs, also called nooms, were marks above each syllable of text to show changes in pitch, rhythm, and manner of expression. Early Znamini notation only shows relative pitches, so we can't interpret it with complete confidence unless we have additional information about each melody. So we can see from the example the Znamini nooms were adapted from Byzantine notation, but they do not always have the same meaning. A particular mark may have meant one thing for the Slavs and something slightly different for Byzantine chant singers. Znamini chant is diatonic, that is, it uses the notes of the diatonic scale rather than all the chromatic notes. It is characterized by its restraint and the degree to which it's oriented to the text. That is, it is written and organized to make the texts being sung in the liturgy exceptionally clear. Most melodies have one to three pitches per syllable, along with occasional extended passages 
called melismas. Manuscripts from this era show that Slavic singers adapted Byzantine melodies, adjusting them to fit the Slavonic language, its, ac its accents, and phrases. Here we have the same Traparian in honor of St. John Chrysostom, in Greek and Slavonic on the left, with Greek on the top. On the right, the same music is laid out line by line. You can see that very similar notation is used for the Greek and Slavonic. Clearly this melody was divided into phrases, and whoever has set the Traparian and Slavonic has attempted to keep the original melody. Where the Slavonic text for a phrase was slightly longer than the Greek, as often occurred, the music has been carefully adjusted to fit the words being sung. A different kind of chant was used for certain hymns, Kantakia, Traparia, Sessional Hymns, and Communion Hymns. This chant was more florid and intended for singing by expert soloists. This kind of singing was later called Kondakarian chant, after the name of the book that contained these melodies, and it was sung by virtuoso performers in the larger churches. It used a variant form of stolp notation, with the great hypostases of late Byzantine chant as a second line of symbols above the stolp nooms. In the example on this slide, Above each syllable of the Slavonic text is one or more znamini marks or nooms in the first row, and above some syllables or groups of syllables is one of the great hypostases. Scholars think that these marks indicated particular kinds of expression that the soloist was to use in singing. Kondakarian singing seems to have died out at the time of the Mongol invasions, perhaps due to the loss of trained singers. We have no manuscripts in Kandakarian notation after 1274. Znamini chant was the principal form of plain chant among the Kievan Rus from 1200 to about 1600. It was well known and superbly suited to the liturgical texts and the singing styles and preferences of the Slavic peoples, but it was not the only form of church singing in use. About 200 years after the disappearance of Kondakarian singing, we first hear of singing in the Demestveni manner. This Demestveni chant was used for chants outside the system of eight tones, for example for the fixed hymns of the services of Vespers, Matins, and the Divine Liturgy, particularly on festive occasions, and it employed a variant form of Znamini notation with some additional nooms. The name probably comes from domestic or demestic, the leader of a group of singers, that is, what the Greeks referred to as the domestikos. Around the same time, we also hear about put or putevoy chant, which provided melodies in the eight tones for special occasions, such as the consecration of a church. The put melodies were generally much more melismatic than the ordinary znamini melodies, and they used more complicated rhythms, including syncopation. Finally, the music for the fixed chants of the services, such as the responses on ordinary occasions, were not normally written down at all in manuscripts of Znamini chant, probably because they were considered too well known for this to be necessary. Up until this time, we believe, although there is no complete proof, that language is completely monophonic, that is, it was sung on the same pitch or in octaves. Some scholars believe that an eson or drone in the Greek style might have been used. But from the 15th and 16th centuries, we begin to have manuscripts of chant with several nooms in a vertical stack above each syllable. These were most likely used for polyphonic singing. Early Russian polyphony emphasized the melodic line in each voice rather than portraying the music as a series of chords. That is, each singer, in a different voice part, would be singing a variant form of the same melody altogether. Another form of polyphony, stroknoia, or line singing, is an example of the same tendency. An example of stroknoia's chant is shown here, although when it is, when it is transcribed and performed in modern times, it contains very dissonant intervals, parallel seconds and fourths, which sometimes sounds quite odd to our modern ears. <laughs> 
It is entirely possible that Russian singers in the 15th century, the time of Renaissance polyphony, had heard of polyphony in the Western style, but weren't sure exactly how it was used. It's also possible instead that we may simply not be transcribing this music correctly, or that the sense of musical concord and discord was different in this era. Also at this time we see references in the Typicon or Ustav and in musical manuscripts to the music of particular regions. For example, some Typicons would have directives that a certain chant might be performed quote, by the right choir in Novgorod Demestveni style, or by the left choir in Strachnoya chant in the Moscow fashion. Individual monasteries developed their own versions of the Sinomini melodies, and these were often used in the hymns written to honor the founders of each particular monastery or other important saints in their calendars. In this way, the chant of a particular monastery would become memorable and well known. Thus, today we have Valam chant, Pochayev chant, and so on. Finally, around this time, we hear about exceptionally skilled master singers, particularly from the major cities of Novgorod and Moscow, who were artful in znamene singing, according to the old chronicles. Some were said to have composed and taught as many as ten or twelve different versions of particular chants. These compositions, some of which have the name of the original singer attached to them, used the melodic material and the popievki, or phrases, from the tone attached to the liturgical text. Thus, if a particular troparion was said to be in tone 4, then a singer who wished to use a melody for it in the Znamini chant would take the phrases associated with tone 4 and combine them in a way that suited the text. Thus, these new musical versions and compositions were part of the overall Znamini tradition. Along with the expansion of liturgical singing in the 16th century, there was a need for, liturgical in, for instruction in liturgical singing and the training of new singers, and we see new instructional materials, the azbuki, or alphabets, named after the first letters of the alphabet in Church Slavonic, az, buki, viedi. Thus, this was an ABC book, or a primer of liturgical singing. The early Azbuki simply listed the Znamini nooms with the name of each, as in the example below. The name of each noom is given, and the noom is written above it. Later, these manuals of chant provided the melodic meaning of the nooms, explaining how each one was to be sung in higher or lower notes. The Azbuki are a key resource in the interpretation of Znamini chant. The Invasion of the Mongols and the move of the Metropolitan of Kiev to the north caused the southwest portion of the Kievan Rus to be politically separated from the rest of what we now know as Russia. This southwest region became part of the Roman Catholic Grand Duchy of Lithuania, with a new line of Orthodox Metropolitans of Kiev subject to Constantinople rather than Moscow. That is, the Patriarch of Constantinople had appointed a new group of Metropolitans in this area to serve the church in that region. Under Lithuanian and Polish influence, music in this region began to incorporate more influence from Western European music. The most important of these was Partesni singing, that is, singing in parts in the European fashion, along with Renaissance polyphony. As early as 1586, a four-part vocal ensemble formed the base of musical instruction in some schools, with the higher vocal parts sung by boys. Part singing became wildly popular and spread from Galicia, the extreme southwest Rus, to Moscow by 1650. Kievan singers were in high demand and frequently brought to Moscow to serve in the choirs associated with the Tsar and the Patriarch. Eventually, music was written in the Partesni style for the liturgical services, with separate books for each vocal part. At the same time, a simplified form of Znamini chant, well suited to harmonization chords, came into being. This was called Kievan chant. The new music that was brought to Moscow included liturgical compositions and settings of the Psalms, but also new three-part songs 
in the Polish paraliturgical style known as cant, from the Latin cantus. These were not intended for singing necessarily in the liturgy itself, but on other occasions, or during moments such as the communion when nothing was happening. Kanti were written in honor of our Lord and of particular saints, as well as on patriotic and historical topics. They typically featured two upper voices in parallel thirds with a matching bass line. Here is an example of a cant, one composed for the victory at Poltava in 1709. By 1586, trained vocal ensembles were common in Kiev and churches were being built or renovated in the Polish or the Western style, with a choir loft, or chori, over the western door of the church, that is, the opposite end from the sanctuary. From the loft, the choir director and his ensemble sang the fixed parts of the services, while the variable parts of each service were sung from the kleros in znamini chant. What did this mean for the relative status of the part singers and chanters? In a quote from a 1586 choir directive, we read, When the singer is in the choir, singing the irakteni, he must leave on the kleros a person well capable of singing to the tones and to the special melodies, and must see to it that there is no confusion. In other words, the good singers, who were singing the popular part music, would normally be in the loft, and although the choir director would be directed to leave some competent individual downstairs at the kleros to sing znamini chant, it's understandable that within a few decades there were comments about the chanters being the least talented individuals who could fulfill that role while the good singers were singing the new and interesting music in the choir loft. Not only that, but as we can see in the illustration from a contemporary icon below of a choir loft, the singers were more likely having a good time. Not only was nominee chant considered old-fashioned, but we see complaints from this era that the nominee chanters are ignorant peasants who really need to be doing a better job. New styles of singing were not the only kind of influence imported from Western Europe. In the West, staff line notation had been used previously for Gregorian chant and was now being used both for vocal and instrumental music. At this time, a variation of the five line chant was introduced in Kiev for notating vocal music. This was called Kievan notation. On this five line staff, we see a clef on the left-hand side, which indicates that C or DO is on the middle line of the staff. And in this example, which is the communion hymn for Sundays, Praise the Lord from the Heavens, Praise Him in the Highest, Alleluia, 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 we can see the examples of the extended melismas, which were sometimes sung in Gregor in Znamini chant. Obviously, the communion is one point in the service at which the communion of the clergy and the people might take a great deal of time, and so an extended melody along this line makes perfect sense. Other melodies were pneumatic or syllabic, with only one or two of these notes above each syllable of the text. Liturgical chants were sometimes written in notations in manuscripts with both the old znamini notation and the new Kievan notation. These were called binotational manuscripts. Early historians sometimes suggested that this was an effort to teach the Kievan notation, but their use by trained chanters may also indicate that the znamini neumes, or znamini notation, were considered to convey some influence or expressive marks that the chanter would need in addition to the simpler Kievan notation. In the year 1677, Kiev was reintegrated into the Russian Empire, and its chant and liturgical notation spread to Moscow and to the rest of Russia. At one time, every Slavonic word ended with a vowel. 
Let me say that again. Every Slavonic word ended with a vowel, although some of these were half vowels, just barely enunciated. Over time, in ordinary speech, these half vowels became silent, as they are today, being merely hard and soft marks, where while in chant the half vowels had notes associated with them, they had to be sung, and so they became pronounced as O or A sounds. This caused a divergence between the Church Slavonic language as sung and as spoken, and what was worse, some of the changes in the vowels caused the words which were sung to mean something completely different from their original intent. This kind of divergent singing was called homonia because the suffix hom was now sung in as homo. This was a great source of controversy because it obscured the sense of the language, causing confusion among the faithful, and sometimes laughter when particular things were interpreted as they would be spoken rather than as chanted. A decision had to be made. Do we change the chant melodies to suit the new pronunciation, or should we keep the chant exactly as it is? This controversy was made worse by the extreme conservatism among Russian churchmen and church singers. They did not necessarily want to change the chant, but they also recognized that this form of divergent speech was a real problem. The Stoklov Council in Moscow in 1551 had attempted to reform church singing along with other changes that it was making in liturgy and church life. It ordered better education for church singers, and it also canonized many new Russian saints leading to a burst of new hymn writing. At the same time, concerns rose about the teaching of proper liturgical chant and its effect on church life. Around 1600, a Novgorod singing master named Ivan Shaidurov began adding red or cinnabar marks to his nominee chant manuscripts. These red marks showed the pitch on the top note of each znamini neum. Later, other singing masters created small black marks called priznaki, which served the same function. And some manuscripts used both cinnabar marks and priznaki. These marks, along with the instructional material in the azbuki, allow us to read znamini notation reliably from the middle of the 16th century onwards. And these transcriptions can also help us to interpret older Znamini manuscripts using the same notation. Around this time, due to renewed contacts with the Greek Church, it became obvious that Russian liturgical practice was in disarray, and varied in a number of ways from the practices formerly used in Constantinople. Issues like Khomania contributed to this controversy. Patriarch Nikon of Moscow set about to resolve these problems by editing the existing Slavonic translations of the service books to match then-current Greek practice. In some cases, he simply adopted changes that had recently been made in the Greek church, while in others he was restoring older practice. He also established a commission to collect, edit, and publish a complete set of Znamini chants using the new notational improvements and corrected for pronunciation. The resulting controversy caused a split in the Russian Orthodox Church, with a group called the Old Ritualists, or Old Believers, being determined to keep to the old ways, predating Patriarch Nikon's reforms. Those Old Believers who maintained a priesthood sang Znamini chant recorded in the Old Notation, with cinnabar marks and priznaki, corrected for the current pronunciation of Church Slavonic. Thus, they specifically avoided other kinds of more recent church singing. Those old believers who abandoned the priesthood entirely, in the belief that the church of their time was without grace, used nominee chant with only the cinnabar marks, not the priznaki, and continued to use texts with the old pronunciation, or komania. Some old believers' communities survived in the extreme Russian north, while others moved into the southwest, into southwest Russia. They continued to use Azbuki and Znamini chant in its original notation to the present day.
Patriarch Nikon had ordered a revision of this nominee chant, but it was not until 1772, more than a hundred years later, that the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church published a complete official set of Znamini chants using Kievan or square notation. To the Znamini chant, these books added selections from Demestveni and Put chant, as well as Greek and Bulgarian melodies, which were used in Kiev. In the 19th century, editions of Kievan chant, harmonized along Western European lines for four-part singing, comprised the core of the Russian court chant. These were in turn supplemented by new composers with liturgical music in the Romantic Western European tradition, adapted to the Byzantine liturgy and the Church Slavonic language. By this time, Znamini chant had been largely relegated to being only of historical interest, or to the margins of the Russian Empire, the sects of the old believers, or those who had other reasons to retain earlier music. In the southwestern part of the Russian Empire, the Kievan Monastery of the Caves continued to serve as a source of liturgical music and manuscripts. Much of this music was in the form of irmologia, handwritten manuscripts containing the music for the Znamini chants in the eight tones, along with certain melodies for the major services. Now, Greek and older Russian irmologia contained only the music for the irmosi of the canons, thus its name, Book of Irmosi. But these new southwestern irmologia added music for stikira, troparia, and other hymns into comprehensive anthologies, which makes them important for studying liturgical music in this era. The copying of irmologia was considered both a practical and a devotional practice, but the complexity of stolp notation made it difficult and exacting as well. In 1601, in the Monastery of the Annunciation at Suprasil in Belarusia, modern Belarus, an entire irmologian was written by hand for the Znamini tradition in Kievan notation, and this manuscript survives to the present day. This is the first known use of lined staff notation for East Slavic liturgical chant. This volume also included a small amount of Demestveni and regional chant, and many notations indicating which chants were used in the services and from where they came. Another important city was that of Lviv, also called Wovov or Lviv, it was a major ecclesiastical center to the west of Kiev. In the 17th century, Orthodox brotherhoods were established in support of Orthodox church culture in this area. Education, particularly singing education, and the printing of books for the church were an important part of the ministry of these brotherhoods. In 1709, a book titled Irmologian, that is, Octoikos, was printed at Lviv, and reprinted over the next 200 years in various forms. This book was widely distributed throughout the Slavic-speaking portions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which Lviv was a part. As we will see next week, the Znamini chant in this book and its successors made up a core part of the Prostopinia tradition. A version of this book was reprinted in 1904 and remains available from the Ukrainian bookstore in Edmonton, Canada. The contents of it include an instructional foreword explaining very briefly the Kievan chant notation, a section for the fixed unchanging hymns of the all-night vigil and of Great Compline. Then for each of the, great to of the eight tones it provides certain stikira of Sunday Vespers, the Treparian of the Resurrection, a group of special melodies, the gradual or stipenna melodies, that is, those for the gradual psalms at Matins, the Irmosi of various canons, Odes 1 through 9, a set of, another set of special melodies, or Podobni, certain feast day stikira in whichever tone is the section is associated with, follow, followed by the Bulgarian or Bolhar melody in that tone. After these eight sections for the eight tones is music for It Is Truly Proper, for Psalms 135, 136, the Polio Lays sung at Matins, 
the exaltations or magnifications for feasts that is the hymns beginning O oh my soul extol whatever the feast is the Bulgarian exaltations that are particular to the Southwest tradition as well as chants for the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts and for the liturgy of St. Basil the Great this is followed by group of Treparia for Saturdays in the Great Fast, the chants for Great and Holy Week and for Pascha, and finally the hymn of St. Ambrose, the Te Deum, which was used by both Catholics and Orthodox in Thanksgiving celebrations. The last part of the book is a table showing which of the Irmosi is used for each canon during the fixed and changing cycles of feasts for the liturgical year. The book contains a total of 576 pages in Kievan notation. Next week we will talk about how the books in the Irmologian tradition came to be used in the churches that employed prostopenia. So to summarize what we've looked at in this lecture, the earliest Slavic chant probably drew on both Byzantine Greek and Bulgarian models for melody and notation. This chant, or Znamini chant, is the core singing tradition of the Kievan Rus. It is based on Byzantine melodies adapt adapted to Slav Slavic singing styles and the Slavonic language. It is diatonic, restrained, and oriented to the liturgical text. It is pneumatic, meaning that there are one to three notes per syllable in most chants, with occasional melismas or long extended passages. Znamini notation, also called stolp notation, or kruki, or hooks, is derived from the old Byzantine musical notation and shows only relative pitches. Later additions to the notation, the cinnabar marks and the priznaki, allow us to fix the pitches more precisely and transcribe them into modern notation. In addition to Znamini chant, other forms of Slavic chant, such as Demestveni chant, Put chant, Strochnaya singing and monastic forms of chant came into use in Russia. The most commonly used music was not written down at all, but only sung from memory. Western influence led to the use of part or partesni singing, kanti, and harmonized chant, first in Kiev and then throughout the Russian Empire. Western influence also led to the adoption of Kievan notation on a five-line staff, which was easier to use than the previous stolp notation. Old believers, as well as those living in remote areas, continued to use nominee chant even after it had dropped out of use in much of Russian Orthodoxy, being replaced by composed chant. The old believers continued to use stolp notation in Azbuki. Meanwhile, in the far southwest in Suprasl and Lviv, Kievan notation was employed for writing down nominee chant. For further reading, Johann von Gardner's Russian Church Singing contains a good analysis of the music throughout this entire period, while Claudia Jensen's Musical Cultures in 17th Century Russia looks at secular and sacred music during this time of extreme change in music in Russia and Ukraine. The first section of Vladimir Morrison's choral performance in pre-revolutionary Russia looks at the adoption of choral and part singing in the lands of the Kievan Rus. Finally, the specialist studies by Milos Vilimirovich and Miroslav Antonovitz look at the Azbuki and the Irmologia from Ukraine.